Now we're going to uh, turn to uh, the third presentation in this session, uh, and that will be uh, by Martine Rothblatt. Uh, she is the chairperson and chief executive officer of United Therapeutics Corporation, UT, a corporation she started to save her youngest child's life from a rare illness. Dr. Rothblatt earned her PhD in medical ethics from the Royal London College of Medicine and Dentistry after, learning, after earning JD and MBA degrees from UCLA, which recently gave her its highest award. Her company is now saving hundreds of lives a year with medicines for pulmonary hypertension and neuroblastoma, and by restoring otherwise discarded donor lungs to transplantability. The company is also in clinical development of manufactured kidneys, hearts, and lungs to be, livered, to be delivered via autonomously flown electric vertical takeoff and landing systems. Dr. Rothblatt led the efforts to create the first genetically modified porcine, porcine, porcine hearts and kidneys transplanted into humans, that is xenotransplantation, resulting in a life-extending xeno heart transplant in January of 2022. In addition to her contributions to medical science, Dr. Rothblatt is also responsible for creating Sirius XM satellite radio and other satellite communication systems. She's pursuing innovations in aviation and architecture, including the design and piloting of an electric helicopter. Her most recent book pertains to artificial cognition and cyber consciousness. Dr. Rothblatt was elected to the American Philosophical Society in 2008. And she is going to be talking this afternoon about life-saving and proof-of-concept human transplants of xenografts from October 2021 through January 2022. Dr. Rothblatt, please. Thank you, Bob. The floor is yours. Okay. I trust that um, the slide presentation is visible to everyone. Or maybe that could be confirmed. Am I changing the slides by sharing my screen, or is the APS staff changing the slides? Um, Either way works with us. I have your slides ready if you'd like. Okay, well, I'll just say next slide and you got it. Okay. All right, I'll get that up in one second. Excellent. Very good. Okay, so as Bob said, I will uh, provide a Xeno update on some of the um, very exciting things that have happened in this field of um, using genetically modified organs as a augmentation to transplantation. Um, and quite a few things have happened just in the past, oh, three or four months. Uh, next slide, please. My efforts to create uh, xenografts began with my request to create an unlimited supply of transplantable lungs so that my daughter, afflicted with pulmonary hypertension, could get one when needed. My literature research revealed no instance of pulmonary hypertension reoccurring post-lung or heart-lung transplant. But the same research showed that most patients died before they could get such a transplant. Pulmonary hypertension patients represented just about 10% of lung transplant recipients, which in the United States meant about 200 per year. However, with the disease's prevalence at about uh, 10,000 patients and their mean mortality under five years, there would always be several hundred who could not be saved 
with donor lungs. I made my first priority developing better medicines for pulmonary hypertension to keep my daughter alive longer, thus buying me more time to solve the organ gap. We now have five FDA-approved medicines for pulmonary hypertension, and my daughter is doing well, so that strategy is working pretty good. I investigated what I could do to increase organ donations, but already 50% of Americans were organ donors, so doubling the number of donors would not come anywhere near closing the five-fold gap needed for pulmonary hypertension alone, not to mention many other end-stage organ diseases. I remembered from my youth uh, that my grandmother received a porcine heart valve due to the good size match of pig and human hearts. Since Dolly the sheep had just been cloned and the human genome had just been sequenced, I thought a good one, two, three solution would be to first sequence the pig genome, then modify enough pig genes to establish human tolerability for its organs, and finally, to clone the gene-modified pigs to produce, produce enough organ transplants for everyone. Just as I hit on this solution, the world slapped a moratorium on porcine xenografts for fear of creating a pig virus pandemic. We were in the midst of the AIDS crisis, and this caution seemed reasonable, if perhaps premature. I thought that perhaps instead my first contribution to creating an unlimited supply of xenografts would be to come up with an ethical algorithm that both protected the public and enabled xenotransplantation research to proceed. This I did in a PhD dissertation under England's leading medical ethicist at the Royal College of Medicine and Dentistry. The title of the thesis and the book ultimately published from it sums it all up your life or mine, how geoethics can solve the conflict between public and private interests in xenotransplantation. As the title implies, the ethical algorithm balanced the public's concern not to face a new pandemic, your life, with the patient's concern not to die from their disease, my life. Key elements of this algorithm were one, so-called Ulysses contract signed with the patient which are kind of non-withdrawable informed consents to comply with infection control procedures. Two, breeding the pigs to foreclose the possibility of transmissible pathogens or pathogenic viral sequences. And three, a commitment to biosurveillance. The dissertation done and the book out, I began looking for teams to help me implement the biotechnology. Next slide, please. And it is at this point that the American Philosophical Society has an absolutely key role in the advent of xenotransplantation. Seen in the photograph there with me is our illustrious um, member of the APS before his passing, Dr. Thomas Starzl. My first stop was with one of the scientists who work, whose work I had cited intensively in my thesis. Those citations were not surprising as I think Dr. Starzl is in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the most peer-reviewed medical publications, something like 2,500, and at some points in his life, about one publication a day. I was introduced to Tom Starzl by our mutual friend, hepatitis B discoverer, Nobel laureate, and um, previous president of the American Philosophical Society, Barry Blumberg who seated us together at an American Philosophical Society dinner in Philadelphia, and we talked until well past midnight. And wouldn't it be nice for those dinners to recommence, hopefully later this year? Tom explained to me about his findings in microchimerism, about the ability to achieve transplant tolerance via antigen induction into immunologically privileged biospaces. By the way, that's an area of research also pioneered by another president of the American Philosophical Society, Dr. Clyde Barker, and about a, a small struggling company that University of Pittsburgh Medical Center had financially supported at Dr. Starzl's instance called Revivacor. And that company had just knocked out the key porcine gene responsible for causing a hyperacute rejection. 
At places like this rooftop of his Pittsburgh office, Tom would explain to me with great excitement the whole bioanthropology story of why we humans lack alpha galactosidase and viscerally bio-revolted when we saw those sugars on donor graphs. He urged me to buy Revivacor and use that company for my strategic dream of creating an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. And that is exactly what we did. Next slide, please. Now, growing up in Los Angeles, I was not familiar with pigs, but on my first visit to Revivacor in Blacksburg, Virginia, I took a fancy to them. I learned at Revivacor that they had already begun the process of getting FDA approval for alpha-gal knockout pork, since there were people with a bad meat allergy called alpha-gal syndrome caused by a bite from the Lone Star Tick. They were all fully on board for a moonshot effort to edit additional genes until we had an animal that can provide us with tolerable vital organs. But which genes? How many could realistically be edited in the time frame that I needed to save the patients running out of time on our medicine? I decided to convene a small tiger team of experts and work with them to agree on a disciplined differential gene editing program by which we could march eight to 12 pre-agreed genes based on already published research in not much longer than 10 years. Why eight to 12? Because given the time needed for editing, cloning, gestation, growth, and testing, not more than this number of genes could be sequentially processed in under 10 years. Contracts with two organizations were able to help us keep on schedule. One contract was with Robin Pearson's lab at the University of Maryland to test our genetically engineered lungs in an ex vivo lung perfusion rig for a few hours. While this is not as good as a prolonged in vivo test, it did give us a quick read on gene choices via transcriptomic data. The other contract was with Craig Ventner's new company, Synthetic Genomics. They provided us with porcine sequencing, gene sequencing at a far higher level of resolution than had previously existed. Next slide, please. The team of experts that I tried to, that I corralled into providing a step-by-step -step logical progression of gene edits consisted of David Cooper, Robin Pearson, Yvonne Dai, and David Ayers. I was trying to gain additional weeks of baboon graft recipient survival by adding the right autosomal genes. If a gene edit didn't add survival, then I wanted to drop it in favor of another to logical to try gene. This is one of several charts resulting from the brainstorming meetings. You'll notice that human von Willebrand factor appears a lot because everybody was very worried about clotting being occasioned by the um, xenografts. While we did test uh, von Willebrand factor genes as shown in this chart, they made no discernible difference in baboon survival. In actual practice, we ended up with a 10 gene xenograft that did not need a von Willebrand factor edit and that does not give rise to excessive clotting. So many things that are assumed from top down are just plain wrong. And a person just has to do the experiments to learn the answers. Next chart, please. Now returning to, now testing in machines and baboons takes up to two years to complete the data, the data for each pig version, uh, to complete the testing until each pig version becomes available. This slide shows that combining the pig genetic engineering schedule and about two years for testing in machines and baboons, all concerned it takes perseverance and several years to achieve a pig with eight or so uh, genetic modifications. One whose organs might have achieved enough months of baboon survival to justify readiness for human use. I think the greatest challenge of creating the 10 gene heart um, was that we had to adapt on new independent variables, the new gene edits each time, based on very little data from the dependent variables, which were how long the baboons could survive. I would sometimes get cognitive whiplash going between our pharmaceutical development teams who don't want to make a decision on anything without a large N experiment and a statistically significant p-value and our xeno development teams 
who want to make decisions based on outcomes in two or three baboons that couldn't possibly be statistically significant. However, the drug discovery method simply would not work for the Xeno Heart Discovery Challenge. So we had to sniff, bump, and feel our way through the murky Xeno statistics as best we could. Next chart, please. The xenograft problem is greatly worsened by the fact that there are a lot of possible genes to try, and it turned out to matter a lot, not only which genes one tries, but where you place them in the genome, and which other genes and coding regions they are adjacent to. The problem seemed almost insurmountably complex and nonlinear. Fortunately, Craig Ventner's team at Synthetic Genomics identified for us ideally situated landing pads within the porcine genome in which we to place optimally constructed cassettes of a few edited genes as a group. I think a good analogy is that before you land a spacecraft on a moon or a planet, it's very wise to first have excellent reconnaissance of the surface area so that you can pick a relatively level place to land. Once we were able to appreciate the porcine genome at a high enough resolution, we are able to design an optimal gene cassette and landing pad docking strategy that streamlined away a great many gene expression variables, and not the least of which were those that affected the uh, reproductive fecundity of the pigs. Next slide, please. After much trial and error, by 2018, we noticed that our results were beginning to diverge for different organs. Our baboon kidney and heart transplants were gaining weeks and even months with each additional rightly chosen gene edit, while our lungs were still failing at just a couple of weeks past the um, gal knockout enabled surpassing of hyperacute rejection. So we decided to split lungs off of our xenotransplantation program and to add in just one more gene for hearts and kidneys with the specific goal of stopping the relentless growth that the porcine organs underwent in the baboon models. Baboons are actually quite small, maybe around 20 kilograms, but pigs are uh, quite large and uh, 200 or, or even more kilograms is, is not at all unusual. The program split with our Xeno efforts focused on hearts and kidneys, while our lung effort went in the direction of allocellularized 3D printed scaffolds produced in our laboratories to prevent the heightened immunosensitivity caused by the innate, innate immune system's unique dominance in the lung compared to the kidney and the heart. This allocellularization program is actually proceeding quite well, but would require its own separate presentation. The one last gene that we added for xeno hearts and xeno kidneys was inspired by the isolated population of people with Larone syndrome, a group of whom you see in this photograph. We decided to add one more knockout, this one unrelated to the alpha galactose and the two porcine sugar gene, gene antigens that we knocked out, but instead a knockout for the growth hormone receptor so that the xenografts would not grow to the huge size of a typical pig organ. Lerone syndrome is an autosomal uh, recessive disorder characterized by a lack of insulin-like growth factor production in response to growth hormone. It is usually caused by an inherited growth hormone receptor mutation. People with Lerone's condition have a significantly reduced risk of cancer and a significantly reduced risk of diabetes as well as a delayed onset of age-related diseases, which of course we would just love to see mapped onto our xeno hearts and xeno kidneys. Too soon to tell, but I certainly hope that happens. The story of Larone syndrome is actually quite fascinating. It seems that the mutation likely arose among Jewish populations in biblical Judea who were expelled by their Roman overlords mostly in the first century of the Common Era. It is likely that the Larones individuals were sent to Spain, a wealthy Roman province, and kept intramarrying. When the Spanish Inquisition arose in 1492, most Jews converted to Catholicism, or at least pretended to. And some of those so-called conversos emigrated to the New World during the following century. Once there, an extended family of Larones individuals set up homesteads in a rural part of what is now Ecuador and Peru, likely to avoid the discrimination that they would have faced in an urban setting in um, those South American areas. 
Gene sequencing has now revealed their 2000 year journey. And I jokingly tell Semitic people who are worried about taking a xenograft not to worry because at least poetically, the xenografts are kosher and perhaps medically halal. I hope I didn't offend anybody with that. Next slide, please. In summary, we created the 10 gene heart and kidney based on trial and error over a decade with hundreds of gene constructs made and well over 100 experiments carried out. Three of our knockouts address preformed antibodies against non-primate sugars that give rise to hyperacute rejection. Two knock-ins downregulate complement cascade associated with acute rejection. Two knock-ins temper coagulation and two knock-ins either cloak or minimize immune system related inflammatory activity associated with chronic rejection. Roughly speaking, it took us about one year per gene to create a 10 gene modified pig. Next slide. In this video I'm about to show, uh, you'll see a description of the 10 gene xeno kidney transplant by Dr. Jamie Locke, which was into a brain dead human donor at University of Alabama Birmingham Medical Center in October 2021. The team has since replicated what we call now the Parsons model and two brain dead transplants using another version of our xeno kidneys have also been done at NYU Medical Center by Dr. Robert Montgomery. Let's roll the video. There should be audio to it. Oops. Well, if there's not the audio, we could just um, go back one slide. I'm, I will get that going for you in just one second. Okay, all good. It's kind of a nice video. screen, share sound, optimist. I didn't know this video clip. For years, researchers have worked toward transplanting animal kidneys into humans. It's a race against time. There are almost 600,000 Americans on dialysis in need of a life-saving kidney transplant. 240 Americans die every day on dialysis, and many of these deaths could be prevented if an unlimited supply of kidneys were available. Pigs are the most promising donor source. Researchers have been able to genetically engineer pig kidneys that can coexist with the human immune system. Surgeons have made multiple attempts to transplant animal organs into humans. But no one has been able to demonstrate how the entire process of transplant of a pig kidney to human would work in the real world. Until now. In seminal peer-reviewed research in the American Journal of Transplantation, a team at the University of Alabama at Birmingham revealed the results of the world's first clinical-grade pig-to-human kidney transplant. Notably, the study was conducted to meet the same standards as a phase one clinical trial, making it mirror, as much as possible, every step of a normal transplant between humans. They started with unique pigs, genetically engineered with 10 gene edits. Three deletions disable genes that would trigger the human immune system and cause rejection. A fourth deletion prevents the kidneys from growing too large in the recipient after transplant. The rest are human genes added to the pig genome to prevent the recipient's immune system from attacking the organ. A herd of donor pigs live in a DPF, a designated pathogen-free facility designed for clinical use. The human recipient was a brain-dead man whose family gave permission for this crucial test of animal-to-human organ donation. Pig donor kidneys must be tissue-matched to human recipients, just like human kidneys. 
The UAV team designed and performed the world's first test to ensure tissue compatibility from a pig to a human. In separate tests, the researchers also confirmed there were no viruses transmitted. Both are critical to the wider implementation of pig-to-human kidney transplantation. After the pig's kidneys were removed, they were transported to UAB hospital, just like a human donor organ. Meanwhile, surgeons removed the recipient's kidneys. Then they attached the pig kidneys to the recipient's arteries and veins, as well as to the bladder. Within 23 minutes, the kidneys had produced urine. The kidneys remained viable and made urine for more than three days. And genetically modified pig cells were not detected in the recipient's blood. This study is an important step toward ending the organ shortage and preventing tens of thousands of deaths each year. Thank you so much, uh, APS staff, for getting the sound going on that, too. That's great. Um, next slide, please. Right. So less than three months after those um, historic uh, xenokidney transplants into brain-dead donors, we were able to save our first actual human life with a xeno heart. Xenotransplantation requires a merging of surgical and immunological skill sets. The world's most experienced xeno heart immunologist was Dr. Mohamed Mohuddin, shown here embraced in my right arm. A few years ago, we readily agreed to his proposal for us to support his team's transition from the National Institutes of Health to University of Maryland in Baltimore. After all, no one had kept baboons living longer with Zeno hearts heterotopically than had he, and his close connections with techniques of the Munich Germany Zeno transplant group gave us confidence that he could replicate his results orthotopically. One of the world's most experienced heart and lung transplant surgeons, uh, Bartley Griffith of University of Maryland, Baltimore, shown with my thumbs up there, uh, has been our principal investigator since we set up a multi-year program at University of Maryland with its former chief surgeon, Steve Bartlett. And integral to everything is the president of our xenotransplantation subsidiary, Revivacor, Dr. David Ayers, shown under my left arm. Next page, next screen, sorry. And there it is, history, first quarter, January 22. Then on January 7th of this year, we were ready to put all of the pieces together. 10 years of step-by-step, -step, meticulous, and often frustrating efforts to modify a magnificent work of nature, the porcine genome, had culminated in a tolerable 10-gene xenoheart. When this marvel of biology and biotechnology was complemented, with new anti-CD40 immunotherapy, the tolerability achieved its needed level of belt and suspenders. Finally, when placed into too large of a chest cavity in a morbidly ill individual with exquisite surgical skill by Bart Griffith, we had the makings of a historic success. But there were still more pieces to put together. The extraordinary patient care team of intensivists at University of Maryland, Baltimore, the lawyers and financialists who had to mind meld with the FDA and the hospital's administration, and of course, the multiply validated consent by an admirably brave patient, Mr. David Bennett Sr. There is no way to know if we could have made a better heart, but to quote Voltaire, often the better is the enemy of the good. This 10 gene heart seemed to work very well and I feel that our main job now is to complete all of the remaining processes and procedures to achieve regulatory approval for its general availability, including, uh, among other things, um, fine-tuning the immunological protocol and fine-tuning the conditions under which the um, animal is grown. Here are a couple of video clips from the night of the historic first-ever life-saving Xeno heart transplant. APS team, there's a little bit of sound, I think, with this one. Here we go. Actually, there might not be sound. Yep, I think there actually might not be sound here. So, um, video clips come. 
The video cuts cover the stages from X Plan to the Central Park from the gig. Here you see the. Um, yeah, we can't the slow down here, so we're going to have to. Um, putting it into a perfusion yeah. chamber for subsequently rolling it down the um, hallways to the human transplant so surface. Out there for, I guess right here. Uh, bringing the heart um, into transplantation. The, um, well, here, the donor right. animal uh, was very stable and the, uh, the organ looks perfect. Good size. And, uh, the extraction of the organ went routinely and uh, it's now nestled in its little preservation chamber waiting for our call to action. Yeah, that part works good. How long does it take you to switch it? They can do it right. Boom, boom. 20 seconds. Who's working the ECMO circuit? His heart function looks great. His blood pressure is very good. In fact, he's on medicine to reduce his blood pressure. That's how good it is right now. Um, we are still struggling a little bit uh, with respect to some preoperative kidney difficulty that he had. So we're still using a little bit of artificial kidney filtration. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think all thumbs are up. I've been asked how we would define success, and I think we've surpassed in many measures what we would have expected. We have a heart that's, you know, out five weeks and performing normally, requiring no assistance. Our immune suppressive protocol that Dr. Mohedon has basically invented and trialed is working flawlessly. Um, don't know what next week or tomorrow is gonna look like, but we're taking one foot in front of the other, and uh, I'm optimistic. Okay, next slide. Go to the next slide. Next. Next. Sorry, it's just giving me a little. Oh. Yeah. There we go. So uh, the next week actually went very well for Mr. Bennett, but unfortunately after six weeks, his health deteriorated and he passed away at about two months past the transplant. The causes of death, um, I would say are complex, uh, but in nobody's view, was it anything related to the 10 gene uh, modifications of the heart? So people are very much reconfirmed in their, in their confidence that this 10-gene heart and, um, and the 10-gene kidney are viable uh, xenografts. 
There needs to be a fine tuning of the immunosuppressant um, regime. As uh, Dr. Um, Griffith said, we were kind of making it up as we went. Uh, people are not baboons and you cannot use exactly the same things with people as uh, with baboons. And, um, and things related to the patient care, that particular patient was very ill before the surgery. So um, I think it was a success, as Dr. Griffith uh, said, but we have, um, you know, a real success, of course, means much longer survival than two months. Now, um, our next step is to go ahead and produce a much larger number of these xeno hearts and xeno kidneys. This is an artist's uh, depiction of our larger de designated pathogen-free facility that would produce uh, thousands of xeno kidneys and xeno hearts, all with a uh, zero carbon footprint um, powered by solar panels. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, xenograft delivery model is also very different from that with uh, human donor organs. Um, instead of organs coming from any accident, any place, going to anywhere, which is the current distribution model, at United Therapeutics, we would produce all of the organs in one location where we can maintain all of the animal welfare, good manufacturing practices, quality control, pathogen-free assurance requirements necessary for FDA-approved biologics. Consequently, we would fly out all of the produced organs to major transplant hospitals on a schedule that each surgical team requests from a single location and deliver them directly to the transplant operating room. As this uh, map shows, we can do this uh, all well within typical UNOS delivery times. Last slide, please. In conclusion, I'd like to share what I think uh, it took to create this seemingly revolutionary realization of xenotransplantation. It took way more than a village. The foundation of what it took was decades of peer review molecular biology research by hundreds of scientists and research associates, more than I can ever name. But just by way of example, I mean research by the likes of Dr. David Cooper, David Sachs, and Megan Sykes. Then it took the combined science and art of genetic engineering, um, as well as animal husbandry. It is not easy to meaningfully modify something as hyper-complex as a pig without actually breaking a thing or two. And breaking genomes is not something that's going to lead to success. While the peer-reviewed Xeno research could guide us in terms of what to do, it could not really tell us exactly how to do it. Here we must pay homage to the generations of scientists and animal care experts who have uh, really learned how to edit genes, clone animals, and breed genetically modified mammals like the pig. Again, there are hundreds if not thousands of people that should be credited, but just by way of example, I would point out Craig Ventner, Emmanuel Charpentier, Jennifer Dudna, Ian Wilmot, and David Ayers. Once we had figured out how to do what we've been advised by research to do, we then had to confirm whether or not we had done it right. We had to test the hypotheses. This involves careful laboratory testing, both ex vivo as investigators such as Robin Pearson led the way, as well as in vivo as individuals such as Jamie Locke, Mohammed Mahoudin, and Lars Burdoff led the way. And again, they're simply, these are simply exemplary names. Along this entire process, um, we had two vital forces that kept us moving from the base of the pyramid you see here up to the top of the 10 gene Xeno heart in Mr. Bennett. First, there was an unrelenting commitment on the part of so many people to make Xeno happen. I used to bristle at the comment that Zeno is the future of medicine and always would be the future of medicine because it seemed to discount our efforts or that Zeno was like an onion with unlimited layers to unpeel so that it seemed to discount also the scientific process. The commitment of so many researchers to let nothing stand in the way is a huge part of what propelled us from the bottom of this pyramid to the life-saving Zeno heart at the top. When I think of unrelenting commitment, despite so many naysayers, I think of my mentors, Dr. Tom Starzl and Sir Magda Yacoub. Finally, nothing like a, a life-saving Xeno heart could have been achieved without immense amounts of good faith and mutual scientific collaboration. 
We owe the success of as much as anything to the cooperation of the pharmaceutical company, Conexa, that made available to us a CD40 supply, as well as the company Ex Vivo of Sweden in providing us steam cardiac solution and the heart transplant, transplant box you saw in the video. But again, there are many more scientific, academic, and industrial collaborators than I can name. If you add up all of the contrib contributors in this pyramid and its ramparts, I think you will see that the first ever life-saving xeno heart and human xeno kidneys were a creation of thousands of people across many decades and dozens of organizations. The xeno heart patient himself, David Bennett Sr., has thanked Dr. Griffith, Dr. Ayers, and Dr. Mahuadeen for giving him a chance to live longer. But I thank the patient himself, for he gave us, the transplantation community, a chance to save the lives of thousands of more patients in this very decade of the 2020s. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Martine. This is just an extraordinarily important and, and utterly fascinating story. And for that reason, we have let it go longer than we ordinarily do. Uh, uh, so I am going to, uh, so to speak, pull the plug, if I may say so. Bad term, bad, bad phrase in this context. Uh, 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 but, uh, and forego questions, we will forward uh, the questions that we have received uh, to you. Uh, but thank you again so much for this incredible work and, uh, and for all of your collaborators. Thanks to all of your collaborators and thanks for this exceptional presentation as well. My and, pleasure, Bob. Good seeing you. Great. And, and with that, I am going to call this uh, session and this meeting of the American Philosophical Society to a close. Thank you all for joining us uh, for these last several days.